enjoy the rest of the service. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Amen. I'm, go I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to do my very best to match that energy because that is... <laughs> Amen. Well, this is offering time again. And today I want to encourage all of us um, to be owners, to, be, to own. God wants us to own. Amen? I'm going to have my PowerPoint on while I'm reading scripture. So out of 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18, it says, For the scripture said, Thou shalt not muscle the ox that treaded the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. What runs a system of economics is the word capitalism, capitalism, right? Capitalism is what runs a system of economics. And the spirit behind that is private ownership. Hello? It is private ownership. So it is for us to own. You have to own whatever. So you become a doctor, you become a lawyer, you become an accountant, you own that, right? And then you bring that to a marketplace and exchange for money, right? So it is important that we own. Ask the neighbor, what do you own? Not the bank, not the bank, not the bank. What do you own? Amen? Listen, the church of God we are collectively to be, I mean, you can calculate our GDP, right? Just as countries do, families do, we can as a church. We, we are the church. When, you, when your GDP goes up, the church's GDP goes up, right? So it is important that all of us assess yourself, where are you, right? What do you own? What value? I tell my kids, young people, you have to become somebody. Otherwise, you're no good to nobody. Hello? God loves you, we love you, but you must become somebody, otherwise you're no good to anybody. Amen? So I want to encourage all of us to be owners. Own. You have to pay off your house. Invest. Own something. It is private ownership. People died so you can own stuff. There was a time that we could not own. God made us to own. What do you own? Amen? So, ownership. You, you study. So that means that the first thing you must do is that you have to improve yourself. Hello? You must bring value. You have to be a person of value. You can consume. They are productive people and they are consuming people. Which one are you? But you must bring value. Okay? So can I have maybe four people to come and help me? I'm going to be quick. I don't want to go. I, have, I can go on. This is my real call, but I'm going, to, I'm going to be very quick. Can I have four people, four people to help you out? Preferably young people. Sorry, sorry, not younger people. Younger people. Those younger... Yes. Come, come, come. Okay. <laughs> So come up here, come up here, come up here. We need, we need, turn around, turn around, face, 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 turn around. There you go. So, so, so here, here, here's, an, here's an example here, this is an example. Bringing value to the marketplace. You are required to bring value. So you study, right? What do you want to be when you grow up? Ooh. He wants to be a doctor. When he, when he studies and become a doctor, he is a doctor, not her, not him, not her. He is. Hello? He owns his skills, right? Private ownership. You got that? What do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, he wants to work for NASA. So, 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 so when he studies and stop playing, you know, stop fooling around and studying and does well in school, whatever skill he gets is for him, right? 
How about you? What do you want to be when you grow up? You want to be a computer programmer. You see? Turns around. They own. They have. They have skills. What? He's a doctor. Nobody becomes a doctor so they can treat themselves. Hello? He becomes a doctor for us, for you. That's a, that's a, different, that's a different discussion. So he's a doctor. He's a NASA person. He's a computer analyst, right? He goes, you, you want to go, you get sick, you come to him, right? He goes to the moon and puts satellites and makes sure we all can do internet, 5G, 6G, 10G. That's what he does. <laughs> he does, he will do a help us analyze. So you see, all the, whatever, she, so whatever value you come, you come and you, and you come, you exchange for, for him, right? So you, for, for medicine, for cell phones, and so forth. The question is, what do you have that somebody's coming to you for? Hello? What do you, if, you, if all you do is pay, 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 what, do you, what skill do you have? You must also be in this line so somebody can give you something. Amen? Saints of God, I'm going to stop, but I want to encourage all of us to be proud to be owners. Own a skill, right? Study, own a skill. Build your net worth. You're 40 years old, where are you? Where did you start? Where are you? Amen? God wants us to raise this church so that the GDP, we can make a difference in the community. And you cannot do that if you're broke. Amen? You can sit down. Clap for them, clap for them, please. So as, as they do that, the next step is capacity. So you're a doctor now, you're a lawyer, whatever, you're making money. The next step that you, you must begin to do, you must be a doctor and something. You have to be a doctor and real estate investor. You have to be a doctor and buy something. And. It's not all. It's and. Hello? It's not all, but and. So to have and means capacity. You cannot be tired. Hello? Anyway, I'm, I'm going to stop for now. Let, let's all start and do our confession. Hallelujah. All right, let's play. Heavenly Father, I worship you. As I obey your word in giving and receiving, I believe that Jesus, who is our great high priest, worships you in my behalf and pronounces my seeds and offerings blessed and multiplied according to your word, so that all my needs are abundantly met, not in a miserly way, but according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I have no lack. Only God's abundance and Abraham's blessings are mine. Amen. Praise the Lord. All the means you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, by all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe seated this morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right, we got the V in there. <laughs> All right, praise the Lord. Uh, well, you know, this is giving month. We're in a blessing. So um, I think, Wanda, you're going to come one more time. Um, going to come and give us a short testimony. What we're doing here, of course, is these are... We are blessing each other this month. So this month is called Blessing Month because we are, we're asking you to pray, ask God how, who to give to and how much to give to. You're hearing the voice of God. You're practicing hearing God's voice. And then you're supplying the needs, uh, the desires of people. And so it's just a marvelous time that we do. We practice it because we want to be a blessing to one another. A blessing to the kingdom of God. That's why we're here. Amen. All right. Go ahead. I want to start. <laughs> All right. I just want to share this time about... Families are very important to me. That's the most important thing besides God is my family. And I want to share back in the day that my niece and her two little children called me from out of state and said, hey, Wanda, I don't have a place to go. Can I come and stay with you? And I said, sure. Now, I'm a single parent. I had making $3.85 an hour. 
And if I didn't work, I didn't, uh, I didn't get paid. Well, she came there. Little did I know that she was on drugs. She stayed with me a, f a few weeks. And after a while, she stole some money from me. Well, she left on a Friday and not to come back. She left her two little children with me on Friday. And I was praying and praying. And I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I had to work. My daughter had to go to school. And so I didn't have anybody to keep them. I had no family up here, no nothing. So I started really going into prayer, praying God show me what to do. And uh, Sunday, I went to church and I sat down. Nobody knew this. I sat down at the church and was just holding my head down praying. And this lady that goes to our church, I've seen her, I've, I've spoke to her and everything, but didn't know her name. She came and sat down beside me. And she says, Wanda, I was praying this morning, and she says, and your face kept on coming before me that I could bless you. And I looked up at her with tears in my eyes, and I said, unless you babysit, that's the only thing I can think that you can help me. And she gave such a big smile, and she says, I own two daycares. And one of them was in the route for me to go to work. On, 20, on, on 25th Street in Bell, uh, Bellwood. And I couldn't believe it. And God said, I would meet your needs if you just trust me. I told her I couldn't afford to pay, pay a daycare. And she smiled again and she says, I'm going to make you an offer that you can't refuse. I'm going to keep both of them. This was like in September, August, September. I'm going to keep them until the uh, first of the year free. That meant she fed them lunch, she did everything. And she kept them for them until January. And then after that, she was gonna charge me $125 a month for two children in daycare. Now you know that's God on there. And I, I just wanted to say, sometimes God blesses in money, but sometimes he blesses in ways that you need him and everything, but I'm just saying, when God tells you to do something, don't hesitate because you don't know who the other person that you're blessing really, really, really needs that. Amen. My, my, my. <laughs> We're doing a good job. Isn't that marvelous? I love that. We've got we to gotta learn to obey his voice. And uh, what a marvelous... You know, coming to church is not just coming to church, singing three songs, hearing a three-point message, and then leaving and going home. We must learn to live out the gospel. I, I'm a practical person. I want to live out the word. I don't want to just have a doctrine that I believe. Doctrines are important. I love doctrines. I love theology. I'm a theologian. But I want to I wanna experience and encounter God. So that's an encounter. What she gave us was an encounter with God. That's what you call experiencing God face to face. Experiencing Christ. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Glory to God. When you call upon him in the time of your need, he will meet your need. Because God really is. He really is real. He's a real God. Glory to God. There's so much involved in that theologically. The providence of God. Why would a woman come to her who owns two daycare centers? That's called the providence of God. In other words, before she even called, <laughs> the Lord was already answering her cry. Glory to God. Blessed be his marvelous name. Man, oh man, that just, just turns me every which way, but, but the wrong way. <laughs> Well, praise the Lord. Two more quick things here before we go forward. Of course, we're reading this book. We want you to get this book if you can. And even if you can't, get it anyway. <laughs> True Stories of the Miracles of Azusa Street and Beyond. This is, the story of a, this is the story of what happened in the 1906 Azusa Street Revival where God pulled out His Spirit as never before. God is, you know, we're in the time where the Bible says sin is abounding, where sin that the bound grace doth more abound. So we're in a time when God's going to pour out his spirit. I'm believing God and crying out to God on a daily basis. 
And I'm telling you, I, I, I've been so blessed recently. Uh, ver, just just give you a real quick testimony before I get into this, and that is, uh, recently I, I've been praying for, you know, some of you know that my background is, is basketball, I played basketball in college and so on. And so going all the way back to the 70s, I prayed for my teammates. So if you're counting that, that's actually over 40 years. And so just recently I just found out one of my teammates called me, I mean, out of the wild blue. And, and man, we, I'm not going to bring a long story, very, very short. We're now praying together on Tuesday and Friday mornings. He, he's what you call saved, saved. When I hear him talk on the phone, I, he just preaches to me. I'm just listening to him and saying, now this, I, this guy, is a, he's from the ghetto, inner city, on drugs, womenizing, everything, drugs you can think of, you can think of, this man was on. Now he's so fired up for Jesus. I just sit there with a smile on my face the entire time and say, please just talk to me some more. And so I remember what he was like. It's Apostle Paul experience. From darkness to light, from the power of God. And you know, and God had me involved with that. As I was praying for him for 40 years, he, told, he said he told his pastor that his pastor, oh my God, oh my God. After 40 years, God answered the cry of my heart. That means don't give up. God is a prayer answering God. Blessed be his marvelous name. I love it. We're praying together. We both feel up early in the morning, so we're praying together. Only five or 10 minutes is what it is. But it's such a marvelous time just to hear him pray. Praying the word of God, the man is not just, it's not some, you can tell when somebody has been in the word. <laughs> He prays the biblical text. He don't pray. Well, you know, Lord, I went down to the, I went down to the market today and I met a person and we just, you know, we had a good time. I, I'm wondering how can people, what, what kind of prayer is that? Now, I'm not, I'm not criticizing the person who prays like that. What I'm saying is that that's a prayer, but it's an immature prayer. When you pray, you pray the word. So shall my word be that goeth out of my, forth out of my mouth and shall not return to me void. How does the word return to God? How? There's only one way. It comes out of your mouth. You speak it back to him. That's how you pray. You pray the word of God. You get a promise, and you say, Lord, this is your promise, and your word cannot fail. I'm going to stand on it. If I have to die trying, I'm never going to give up. I'm never going to give up. I'm never going to quit. If you need healing in your body, say, Lord, your word says himself took my infirmities and bore my sicknesses. I would have to bear them. The same God who forgave me of all of my sins has healed me of all of my diseases. Psalms 103. That means none of them, none of, no disease should be able to dwell in your body. Oh, I don't believe that. Well, then that means you must believe that sin must dwell in your body. Because the Bible says in Psalms 103, the same God who heals, same God who forgives, heals. It's the same God and the same power. Glory to God. I love it. I'm not even on the sermon yet, but I'm already excited. <laughs> One more thing before we go. You know, of course, this is the season in which we vote. And I want to encourage you. We've got a voter guides out there. If you don't know, I want to encourage you. Of anything in life, I'll tell you again. I said it last week and I'm going to keep saying it. The greatest sin, sins ever perpetrated on mankind have been perpetrated by politicians. Every single, everybody say every single, every single. Mass, murderer mass murderer was a politician. You don't believe it? Start with Hitler. Start with Mao. Start with Stalin. And go on down the line. Now, now, I don't mean every mass murderer, period, but every mass murderer that kills millions of people, all of them have been politicians. Attila Dahan, what was he? A politician. Oh, you don't think you need to vote? And here's the key. Not only must you vote, number one, you must vote the right way. What's that, Pastor Jackson? How's that? Not according to your values, but according to God's values. That's the key. What does God think about what you think? What does God think about what you think about the, at that particular politician? Have you ever asked him that? If you haven't, I can guarantee you're voting for the wrong person. Yeah, because the reason is because you must bring God in on your life. He wants to be the Lord 
Now, if you're, when you walk through the church doors and you walk in and sit down and say, no, I'm going to serve God today for the next two hours. You go out the door and then you go back to your own way again and live your life the way you want to. You live your life according to God's word means he's the Lord of your life. That's the Lord of your church life, your business, your family, your, your, the government, uh, entertainment. You can't look at pornography on the, on, the, on the internet and television and wonder why your prayers don't get answered. <laughs> Yeah, God is real. He wants to be Lord of your life. We must submit our lives to him. When you make him Lord of your life, you say, Lord, become Lord of my life. You direct me in every area of my life. Glory to God. All right, praise the Lord. <laughs> Father, we want to thank you for the word of the living God. It is our privilege this morning to hear, thus saith the Lord. Thank you that I don't speak with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power, that the faith of those who would hear would not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. We've come here today, not for three nice points, not for three songs, not to give an offering, but we've come today for the presence of God, the Shekinah, the glory of God. Shama, that is your name, the presence of God. We want to know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your sufferings being made conformable unto your death. This morning we thank you for it, we bless you, and give you glory and honor. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. God is a good God. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Tell somebody, tell your neighbor, say, I'm, you know what? It, my father used to tell me all the time, you've got some good people at Wheaton Christian Center. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, glory to God. You are a good person. Glory to God. You are a good person. <laughs> yes. God loves you. Amen. He loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. He demonstrated his love for us in the while we were yet sinners. Over the last several months, I've been, all I've been envisioning is a cross of Christ. I love that thought. The substitutionary sacrifice of my Savior. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Why? Because of the cross. He took upon himself the sin of the world, which includes my sin. And through that, I became righteous. Glory to God, I love that thought. It makes me just want to lift my hands to him all day long. I cannot, give an, I cannot understand a person that doesn't, give, doesn't have anything to give God praise for. If God did nothing for me but the, but the cross, I could praise him for all of eternity. My sins, which are many, have been wiped away by the blood of the lamb. Glory to God, I love that thought. It's called the substitutionary sacrifice. Instead of the wrath of God coming upon me, Jesus intercepted it. Boom, and it hit him. Glory to God. Marvelous. This is all of, our, all of his ways. Thank you, Father, for it. Well, we're on a series, praise the Lord, on um, becoming stewards. Glory to God. And we're, we've been talking about the 15 purposes of God, 15 biblical purposes for money. So I appreciate this morning I thought Pastor Lawrence is going to preach my message. <laughs> Glory to God. That's all right, though. We're on the same wave. That just tells, tells us God is on the, we're on the same wavelength. It's so important. We're in a day when people are, can, people are, the cancel culture is canceling people's lives. That's why you must prosper. We've been on this for, about for maybe this is maybe the fourth or fifth time on this series, and it's a very important series because God's word must be, you must prefer God's word in every area of your life, and that includes the financial area. Don't think that this is a, a secular message or a carnal message. It's very important to your life because you deal with money every day of your life without exception. That's absolutely, absolutely true. You dealt with money this morning. You got here in the car. Car used gas. Car costs money. You took a shower. The water costs money. You ate food. When you get home, you're going to eat food. All, the, all of that is nothing more than money. So don't think that this is a carnal. I, I told you in the very beginning, I'm a practical person. I believe in practical, fundamental Christianity, which means you're living it out. You're practicing it on a daily basis. When we say, thank you, God, for our food, what, is it, what are you thanking God for? You're thanking God for the fact that he provided for you. 
or in order to provide the food for you and nobody gave it to you, even if they gave it to you, they had to pay for it to get it from somebody else to give it to you. So along that line, there was money involved. So it's important that we become stewards. So very quickly, in the very beginning, we're talking about uh, these are the two ways in which you become a steward, creating money and using money. If you, don't, you can't use what you don't have, so you've got to have creating money first, making money first, and then, so God wants you to be a steward of all of that. You know, God has called us to be a steward in every area of our life, not just in money. People who take drugs are poor stewards of their bodies. People who use alcohol are poor stewards of their bodies. If you become a poor steward of your body, you know what happens to your body? It conks out on you. You see, you might say, well, I've been, taking, I've, been, I've been drinking for 20 years or 30 years. You don't realize that in the mercy of God, you, you've been okay because God has probably somebody's been praying for you or your body has, has been it's so fearfully and wonderfully made that the living God has caused it to be able to adjust to your abusing it. I can remember when, I, when I, someone tried to get me when I was in college. You know, when you get 18, you get off, 18, 19 years old, go off to school for the first time, got on my, on my floor, and there was a bunch of us kids, uh, young people, all of us 18, and while I, while there was a bunch of freshmen, and they all bought kegs of beer. And they came to me. And they were all drinking, and they were all smiling and grinning. You ought to try this, man. And of course, I, I, they didn't know I didn't try, but I had never drank in my life. And so, you know, uh, because I was curious like a cat, I took a little sip. And I, you know, this is how God always works with me. I took a little sip, and I said, this, this stuff is nasty. <laughs> right. So you know what I told, asked him? I went and I said, his name was Charlie. I remember his name. His name was Charlie. I said, Charlie, uh, um, I said, do you like this? And he said, he said, do you like beer? And he says, no. I looked at him, I said, this is the question of, the, of my life. This, this next question changed my life. I said, why do you do it then? Why do you drink? And he says, because all my friends drink. I looked at him and I said, a fire rose up inside of me. I said, that's the stupidest answer I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I will never drink. It's because of somebody, everybody around you is drinking. You think about this for a minute. Let me just go on this tangent. <laughs> they say, what well, is a social drink? Beer, drinking alcohol is social. I, just, I thought about that statement. I said, really? Water is, a, can be, uh, uh, beer is a, a liquid. You take it, put it in a cup, and drink it, and it goes down your throat into your stomach. And then you, it comes out, right? right? Well, you do the same thing with water. Right. Why can't I have water be a social drink? <laughs> Lemonade, Kool-Aid. Why do you have to have, why, why does beer have this, this idea a social acceptance as a social drink. Somebody just said that. Right. They just made it up. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's go have a beer together. Why don't we, why don't we go have a water together? Right. Right. It's so much cheaper. Right. You ought to clap over that. Right. <laughs> See, I'm a practical person. <laughs> I like my money. <laughs> I'm just going to say one more story. I'm sorry. And I'm, I promise we'll get back to the message. My, my, my auntie came one time and gave me this. She knew I liked lemonade. I'm a lemonade connoisseur. I got two types of lemonade in my refrigerator all day, all year for probably 30 years. I love lemonade. She knew that. She, she brings me a drink and it's, it has, it's lemonade and it's spiked. She says, Derek, you'll like this because it's, you know, it has, it's lemonade, but it has a little bit of this in it. Huh? Oh, that's what it's called, Mike's? Oh, it has a name. Uh uh. Is that true? <laughs> I didn't told the story a hundred times. I never knew that. It has a name. So she gave me this. I think it's, I mean, you know, you know, you know, I watch Westerns and they have these little things. They could go like that. The thing was about that big. I'm looking at her. She says, take a sip of this. And so I took a little sip of it. And so she says, yeah, she ain't that good. It tastes like lemonade. I said, how much it cost? She says, $4 and something cents. I looked at her. I said, you must think I'm, I didn't say, I thought it. I didn't say this is my aunt. I want to respect her. You must think I'm a fool. I can go home and get two gallons of lemonade for $4 and something cents. 
I'm gonna pay for that little teeny. First of all, I hate cups, small cups. I was in a small cup, I hated it. I can't stand small cups, uh, anything. And then she's gonna give me something that's gonna cost four dollars and something cents for a little teeny swig. Say, y'all, shot, it was called a shot, thank you. A shot. Get it, get it right, Pastor Jackson. You know I don't drink. <laughs> I can't, I don't know none of the names. <laughs> Glory to God. All right, where were we at? <laughs> Glory to God. Stewardship. Stewardship of your body. Watch what you put inside of it. Eating, drinking, those, all, those things will all help you live a long life on the earth. Amen. Amen. Glory Amen. to God. I, I love feeling good. Amen. I hate feeling bad. Amen. You never know how good it feels to feel good until you feel bad. All right. Here we go. We are called to be custodians of God's resources. Moving forward. This is the scripture right here. It's foundational scripture. God gives to every man for us. Every man for us. For every man to whom God has given riches and wealth. Which is wealth our gift of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Moving forward. Uh, these are the other scriptures that, that confirm that. All the places, not all, I shouldn't say all the places, but some of the places in the Bible where it calls riches and wealth a gift from God to man. All right, moving forward very quickly here, Miles Monroe said, where purpose is unknown, abuse is inevitable. So if you don't know the purpose of something, you're going to abuse it. If you don't know the purpose of money, you're going to abuse the money. Amen. So that's why the Bible says, many are the plans in the person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. We must find out God's purpose for everything in life. If you do, you'll never be out of the will of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, 15 biblical purposes for money. We've looked at these already, these four. We're on this fourth one here for good. Now, um, the, the verse, Deuteronomy 39, says this, And the Lord, God will make you plenteous in every work of your hand, free of your body, free of your cattle, free of the land, for good, for the Lord uh, will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. So we see here that the Bible says, we're not going to go over this part of it again because there's, there's a second part of this. There's, there's two, two different types of good here that I want to refer to. This good is saying that he multiplies what you set your hand to for good. He's showing you good by multiplying what you set your hands to. All right? So that's the first part. God multiplies you for good to do you good. Psalm 119.68 says, God is good and does good. The second part I want to talk about today is, how do I monitor whether I've reached God's good? How do I measure this? I don't know if you know it or not, know it or not but the Bible says, one of the most important verses in all the Bible, you ought to write this down and memorize it and so on. It says, examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. Prove your, prove your own self. Pastor Lawrence just talked about this. Examine your own life. That's a biblical principle. Find out where you're at. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you're not your own self. Either Christ be in you, except ye be reprobates. You might say, Pastor Jackson, that's the King James Version. It's kind of weird. How about another version? It says here in, in New, I like NLT. Uh, recently, I just kind of got turned on to it. But I mean, I like all the versions, really, because I think that my, I, I study the Bible from a computer, and I have eight different versions on the computer. And I have, that's, not all, that's only the ones I can fit on my page. I have about... Ten other ones. I just saw, look, these, use these eight. And so I'm always using different versions. But it says, examine yourself to see whether you being the f your faith is genuine. See, how do you know that your faith is real? You say, I love Jesus, but how do you know that? Test yourself. Surely you shall know, surely you, surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. That means you should examine your own self, examine your own life to see whether the faith that is in you with it is real. This verse is, real, is real to me because I use it every single day. All in the morning, I cry out to God and say, Lord, examine me to see whether I'm in the faith. Because, you know what that's called? It's called living a penitent life. When you pray that prayer, examine yourselves, and then you say, wait for the Lord, he will reveal to you things in your life that you need to repent of and turn away from. Don't think you're too holy that you can't grow in the Lord. Amen. Once you do that, you're, that's called pride. Amen. That's why you must call up to God and say, Lord, search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my ways. See if there be any wicked way within me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me. Let the Holy Spirit's light shine upon your life and say, Lord, let this part of my life be known. That's why we need to have the Lord sh shine lights on us and shine lights in us. 
And we need other people on the other on the hand, we need people that can come in and say to us, you know, Derek, this is not right. You know, do this differently. Say it differently. Use different words or whatever it is. We need each other to help us to be corrected in life. We need God, because God will use him, God, the Holy Spirit will also do that for us, but also use others to do it for us as well. So we need that. So that's why examining yourself is very important. ESV version says, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself or do you not realize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Don't think you only get tested in school. No, God tests you as well. Examine yourself to see whether, say, Lord, search me, O God. Let the power of God come upon you. So there, the, the question is, we're, we're asking is, how do we know, how do we know whether we're in the faith? This is not the only way I'm going to read to you in a minute here. This is not the only way you know. This is a way in which you know. A means there's maybe other ways, but this is a way. And so uh, look at your neighbor and say, put on your seatbelts. Yes, sir. We serve, we serve a perfect God. And the God has a perfect standard. And the perfect standard is Jesus Christ. That's why he must live inside of us. See, our righteousness is, our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. That's why we must have righteousness imputed to us in order to be saved. But it's not just a spiritual experience. That spiritual experience of righteousness is imputed to your account manifests in every area of your life. So, examine yourselves. How do we do that? Let's look at the first verse first. It says, a good man. The question I'm asking you today is, how do I determine if I'm a good person? Now, I must watch myself on this because, you know, this, this one man asked to Jesus in the Bible, you know, you know, uh, you know, about being good. And Jesus said, why, why do you call me good? Because the man did not believe he was God. And so he said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. He was not telling, he was not saying he wasn't good. He was saying, you don't believe that I'm good. So why would you call me good? So in, in the eyes of mankind, if you ask any human being, every person will say, I'm good. I'm a good person. If you ask a person, a human being, I don't care who they are, they can be the worst sinner, they can be a mass murderer. If you say, are you a good person? They say, yes, I'm a good person. I'm not talking about that in that, that this in that light. We are good only because we have God living in us. We are, we are, our human natures are evil. But the question is, how do we know that we're practicing what God calls us to practice, to do what God has called us to do? Well, there's, there's a way in which you do that. You can test yourself in this area. That's what I mean when I say examine yourselves. So the Bible says a good man. So what is it talking about? The next several phrases after this, words are telling you what a good man is. Why would God put that in the Bible? He wants you to to measure yourself, test yourself, examine yourself based upon this standard. You don't just say, you don't just say, I'm a good person because I haven't killed anybody. I'm a good person because I haven't stolen anything. First of all, you're lying, which which automatically makes you a, a bad person. How many times must you lie to become a liar? Uh Uh-oh. There is no statute of limitations in God. You lie when you're two years old. That lie fades away when you're 52. No, it's still there. You don't feel it, but it's still there. How do I get rid of the lie? You confess it. Lord, I lied. I repent and turn away and I put my trust in the cross of Christ. The blood comes and washes the lie away. That's the only way you get rid of sin. No other way. So, it says a good man. So, it's talking about a good man. It says if you want to be a good man, this is what you must do. Shows favor and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Next verse says, the word favor there, uh, uh, the next screen will tell you what it, what it is in the, in the Hebrew. But the word favor there's a word, is the same word as merciful in this verse. That's why I'm connecting them. He is merciful. He who? A good man. A man who shows favor is the same word as the word, he is, he is ever merciful. So this, these two verses are connected. 
and lens and his seed is blessed. Okay, so what does this mean? It says the very first point of a good man is he must show mercy, he must show favor, and is merciful. These two verses say that. Can you see that way I'm getting that from? All right, move forward. The word favor and mercy, watch this. This is why I love this part of it. It says it means to bend or to stoop in kindness to an inferior, to favor, to bestow, to beseech. It means to have pity upon, to pray, to make supplication, to show mercy. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to look at a person as an inferior because nobody's inferior to you and nobody's you know, superior to you. All men are created in the image and likeness of God and therefore they're equal. All equality without exception comes from the fact that the Im- from the image and likeness of God. That's why there's no difference between a white and a black and a brown and a yellow person. They're all, we're all made in God's image and likeness. Those colors are simply degrees of melanin that you have in your skin. You have more melanin, you're darker, you have less melanin, you're lighter. That means the only color you are physically is a color of melanin. So there's no such thing as a black, white, and red, and a brown, and a yellow person. That doesn't even exist. On a genetic level, everybody's the same color. It's called me- melanin. That's why it's, it's an asinine to hate somebody because of the color of their skin. But this verse here says, call non means, it means to favor. It's really saying serving. It's talking about serving somebody. We have a term here called serving kindness. Romans 2 forces the goodness and kindness of men leads men to repentance. So it's saying that a good man is kanan, shows mercy. He says he stoops in kindness to somebody who he perceives is not on their level. See, if you're a, my, my parents got saved from a woman who was a teacher in a school and my dad was a janitor. But she saw my dad as her equal because even though she had a degree and she was a teacher, my dad was a janitor. Why didn't she look down on him as somebody say, well, I don't, I, don't have, I don't have anything to do with him. He's only a janitor. She, she didn't do that because she knew that he was in the image likeness of God just like her. Yeah. So you don't look at people as superiors and inferiors. Yeah, right. Now, in position, you can be higher than somebody else, but that doesn't make you better. Right. It just makes them a, a higher position. We are to honor authority. That's okay. It's okay to do that, but see, I want you, I want you to see here that this, this verse here says a good man shows favor, shows mercy, or shows kindness, or looks at other people and, and says, you know, uh, you know, this person right here deserves my attention. So, he will guide you in the Pharisees' lens and so on. So, these verses we looked at already. So, we see that this, this first point is what describes a good man. But the Bible, is no, this, this verse doesn't only use that point. Now if we stop right there, we would win, but we would be, we would be stopping short. Right? The verse doesn't say a good man shows mer- favor, favor and it ends the verse, does it? It says something else there. It says and. You know what the word and means? It means that connecting the fir- beginning, the, the b- first part of that verse to the second part. It means that they're inseparable. You can't uh, separate them apart. They're connected together. Now you look at the next word, you know what I'm going to say, and you can read it for yourself. I didn't write this. You don't see my name on this? <laughs> it's Ann Lins. So the very first, second thing that shows a good man that says a good man lends. Lends what? Right? <laughs> well, that's a question we got to answer. So the word lens means lava, to unite, to remain, to borrow. To abide with, to borrow, to cleave, join, lend. Now remember those, I finished right there, you don't see anything about money in there, right? right? Now, what I did was that, this is how you interpret the biblical text. First of all, you look at the definition of the word, then you go through the Bible and you find out where it's used in the Bible to find out what the context is saying about that word. Now you know the definition of a word from, so definition comes from, its, it's, it begins with its definition, then it ends with how it's used in the verse. Well, look at the verse and it says, this word lens in the Hebrews is used 14 times in the entire Old Testament. Every single time it's used, it's used in the context of money. Let me give you an example. Nehemiah 5.4. We have borrowed money for the king's tribute. Now, is borrowed talking about money? 
come on now, answer that question now. The verse is we borrowed money. So he, he didn't borrow a shirt. He didn't borrow, a, you, know, you know, a broom. He didn't borrow a flower. And what did it say he borrowed? Money. Next verse. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. What's that verse talking about? Money. money. Another one. Deuteronomy 28, 12. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. What's it talking about? Money. money. Verse 44, same chapter. He shall, lend to, he shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. It's talking about the curse. The first 15 or 16 verses in, in Deuteronomy 20 are talking about the blessing of God, then it transfers over to the curse. He shall lend to thee, he meaning someone else, shall lend to you, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. When the curse of God comes upon you, the, the positions of mankind reverse. God doesn't want you to be the head. I want you to be the tail. I want you to be the head. Yeah. But when the curse comes, you disobey God and sin becomes part of your life, then the positions reverse. So if you want to, I didn't want to go through all 14 verses. So I just said, I just gave you four real fast. You can see all throughout the Bible, this is talking about money. Let's move forward. So the Bible says, a good man, everybody say a good man, good man. shows mercy and favor. Um, a good man also lends money. I didn't write it. <laughs> Don't get mad at me. All I did was read it. Now, here's the one, the next one here, I said to put on your seatbelts, right? <laughs> the next one says a good man. So what is it talking about? A good man. Leaves an inheritance to its children's children. And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Now, you might say, Pastor Jackson, that's not talking about money. It's talking about uh, a, you know, intelligence or a college degree. Ah, uh, you know, well, the very next part, you know, there's people that say the context is very important. The last part of the verse is the wealth of the sinners later for the just. Now, ask yourself this question. What kind of wealth does the sinner have that you want? <laughs> Don't lie, just tell the truth. There's only one answer, not two or three. <laughs> just one. I don't care. I, I, I want the, why, do, why would I want the sinner's education? I can get my own education. I don't want the sinner's, you know, I certainly don't want their belief about God. They're sinners. They don't even believe in God. I want that? Oh, no. They only have one thing in life that I may want. Only one. The richest people in the world in the United States today are atheists. That's Reverse of God's will. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Now, you can apply the idea of knowledge to this because an inheritance can mean it's very broad defined, broadly defined, defined. Now, but you, what you can't leave out of it is money. I don't have any problem with you saying my, my, my dad was a doctor, my, my mama was a lawyer, and I understood how to, now that I'm, I need to get an ed education, I go out and get a, ed get a good education because my mother and father, they were very, you know, powerfully motivated by getting their books. Yeah. So I can take that as inheritance. That's a good thing. But to say it doesn't talk about money is you are, you know, well, you're, you're corrupting the Bible. It clearly, it clearly means money. Now, Watch this. I told you to hold, hold on, put your seatbelts on. See, some of you say amen to that, but you really didn't read the text. This is a, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Say, oh my. <laughs> that verse right there is an oh my verse. <laughs> but you have to remember who's t saying it. God is a perfect God. He's giving you, God cannot give you a standard below perfection. It's impossible. He cannot, he, cannot, he cannot grade you on a curve. He can only grade you by the person of Jesus Christ. If you don't have him, you're going to die and go to hell. I don't care how many good works you say you've done. You must have Jesus because he, he is a perfect God and gives a perfect standard. So the perfect standard of God says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Well, how many children is that? Quietness at Baptist Church. 
My question is, how, how can you leave an inheritance to your children's children? It's hard if you leave an inheritance to your children, let alone your children's children. But you say, I, I want to be a good man. You said that at the very beginning, right? Well, I'm defining for you what a good man is from God's perspective. I'm not done yet. Let's move forward. So inheritance, it says a good man shows mercy, lends money, and get, leaves an inheritance to his children's children. The biblical text says that. Not Derek Jackson. It's not my idea. If you ask me, I don't like it too much. You know why? Because it puts a massive responsibility upon me. We don't like that kind of thing. We want to we lay around and do nothing with our life and sit back because we see everybody else doing the same thing. I can't get that money because you know what? I'm not an athlete. Athletes make millions of dollars. And that means I can't make it because I'm not an athlete. Really? When you stand before God, you think that's gonna, that excuse is going to pass for you? You know what you're going to be judged on when you stand before God? The biblical text. Thy word is true from the beginning. And every one of thy righteous judgments endures forever. God's word does not change. I already know how I'm going to be judged. I already know the answer. I don't have to wait till I don't have to, I don't have to have, be a brain scientist. I, don't, I can just read the biblical text and he can tell me exactly what I, God's going to show me and judge me on. When I read this, I don't, I don't, I'll be honest with you, I, I don't get excited about it. I say, oh my. But I, I, it's incumbent upon me as a pastor to tell you what the Bible says. Not to make you feel good about it. Let's move forward. So a good man multiplies riches. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 9. That's what the word uses plenteous in the, in the Deuteronomy 30. Shows favor. Lends. Generational wealth. How do I know that? Generational wealth is the children's children. That's generational wealth. That's the highest form of wealth. God does not want you, your children to start where you're at. He wants your children to stand on your shoulders and go from that point up. That's what generational wealth is. Generational knowledge, generational education. They should, you should teach them and teach them to stand on and go further and higher than you, not go lower than you and stand. No, I'm mad at you, my, my son or my daughter, because you make more money than me. That is sick to me. I, you, don't, you don't even know how many people I've heard tell me that. I don't want my child to make more money than me because I, I, you know, I, I need to make some money. Well, you need to get delivered a love of money. That's what that is. <laughs> I'll be glad if they make more money. Glory to God. How, I don't care how much money you make. If you make more money than me, I'm, I'm going to shop with you. You want somebody to shop with? You get a raise? Call me. <laughs> I'm going to shout as hard as you shout. Glory to God. I don't have an envious bone in my body. I love when people get new cars, new houses, and whatever they want. Those things in life are very important to our lives. Don't think that's, a, that's not a carnal statement. That's a biblical statement. <laughs> Glory to God. What, what's, what the problem is that many of us have, have, a, have a poverty syndrome and we think that we have never heard a preacher preach on money before. And the Bible's full of it. If you notice, if you, some of you have been here since I started this, this series, which is about five, four or five, six sessions ago, I, haven't even, I think I've mentioned one New Testament verse. I haven't even gone to the New Testament yet. I'm on the old still. The Bible is full of this. I don't have any idea why a preacher wouldn't preach on this. I didn't make, so do you see the verses up there? I didn't get this from Newsweek or Time. I got it from reading the Bible. Because I believe the Bible is true. I don't pass it away with the apostles and prophets. I don't pass it away. I don't say, well, that's only for Israel or the Jew. That is such a crazy statement to me. They say it's only for the Jew. Well, Jesus is only for the Jew? If that's true, how, how are you saving you're not Jewish? He died for the world. And his inheritance is for the world. Glory to God. So how do I accomplish this, you might say, Pastor Jackson? This is such, this is so, this is difficult to hear because I'm living, I want you to see that God has much more for you than what you are now experiencing. My goal, and this is not to put anybody down, or, or it's, it's to have, to thank God, I need your help. Prov you are my provider. My goal is to get you to cry out to God and say, man, I, I've been living so far beyond, below what you've called me to do. How do I reach where you want me to be? When you cry out to God like that, he will answer your cry. 
most of us don't cry out to God because we don't know. We, we, only, we think only what somebody else has experienced. We look at what they, they, that person over there has, this person over there has, that person over there has, and we think that's all that there is to it. No. The richest man in America, I mean, those people have grown from that. They used to be millions of dollars in the past 30, 40 years ago. Now they've gone to, into the billions. Now they've gone to the hundreds of billions. Answer a very easy question. Why do you think that's the case? They just, they just grew like that for no reason? Where's all that money, where's all that money coming from? So one way, one way, not every way, I, I like this verse here, it's a marvelous verse. It just says, that it's a, it's a verse about the 10, uh, they, they're asking God, there were 10 people who were asking God, you know, about you know, uh, where I should go and so what, what I should do. And he, and he says to them, occupy until I come. And I, I, I'm, a, I'm not going to, I'm only focused on this part of the verse because I want you to see the word occupy means, I think I have it up here, the definition. No, I don't have it up here. The definition, it means, it means actually doing matter. It means starting a business. It means you must get involved and not, not absent yourself or pull back from areas of life in which you can create money in. You must involve yourself in areas of creating money. If you say, I don't want to do that, Pastor Jackson, then you don't want to be a good man then. The Bible gives it specific directions, a specific standard of what, what defines a good man. When you pass away as a, a man, you should leave something for your children and your children's children. Right now we have a government now that's taxing it's called an inheritance tax. That's a demonic tax. It's a double tax. Why is that true? Because you put people in office that don't know the word of God. That's why. No, no government officials should come in and in on how much money you leave to your children. That's none of your business. I can't understand how crazy that is. But, it, but I do understand. When you, have, when you leave the word of God, it affects every, every area of your life. So they're taxing, you leave so much money to your child, and the government said, that's too much money, we want to tax it. Now, now the parents already pay taxes for it. Right. Right. How in the Bible can that be of God? Right. Come on now. No, I'm telling the truth. People want to raise taxes, that's demonic. You serve a political party, all they want to do is raise taxes, that's demonic. Absolutely. First Samuel chapter, where well, I get that from, from my, own, my own political views, no, I got it out of the Bible. 1 Samuel 8, God tells Samuel in the text, Israel says, we want a king. God said, no, you don't need no king. I'm no king. We want a king anyway. And so God says, go ahead and give him a king. But tell them, here is what I want you to know what's going to happen if they take a king. One of the things on the list was, watch this. <laughs> you listening? It says, a 10% tax rate. God says that's called tyranny. Now, y'all live in America. That's like me. Y'all know, look at your check, you're like, look at your check and see if it's 10% of a tax on that, on that check. And even if it was, it would be tyranny. I'm preaching real good this morning. I don't just vote for parties. I want to, what, 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 is your, what is your view on the word of God? I don't care about the word of God. Well, check, red check, check. Next. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not here trying to make you mad. I'm trying to get you to think differently than what you thought before about your life. Governments destroy individual prosperity. The Bible is full of the word oppressed. The oppressors are the, those in authority. And they oppress the poor. Glory to God. All right, next. That's number four. Number five. Now this one right here. Now notice what I said about what you to do when you're going have to have to have a lot of money in order to give an inheritance to your children's children. The Bible doesn't end there. <laughs> and I tell you, put, put your seat, seat, your seat belts on. Now he wants me to give us, give to the need, give, to give to those in need. Not your children, your children's children. This is above and beyond that. 
Here's the Bible, here's the verse, the verse. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, work, working with his hands, the thing that is, which is good, that he may have to give to him that needs. Another version says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, own hands. I like that part of it. So that he may have something to share with anyone who's in need. I think I have one more version up here. It says, he who steals the most must steal no longer, but rather he must labor performing with his own hands what is good so that he may have something to share with the one who has, who has need. I think I have one more version here. Right, this is the one I want to get to right here. All four of these. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Amen. Glory to God. This verse is an oh my verse. Now, it's talking about your needs. It's talking about the needs. Give to those who have need. So there's actually three words in this verse I want us to focus on. One is needs. First one is needs. Anyone and generously. Before I get to that, the Bible says labor. It says don't steal anymore. So stealing is not an Old Testament prohibition. It's a godly prohibition. Stop stealing. Don't, uh, you know, embezzle money. Don't cheat on your taxes. <laughs> so now you, got, you say, I passed section, got the message now. No, I'm right on it. <laughs> Stop stealing. You don't have to steal any money at all. Why? You know, you know why I don't steal? This is the number two reason why. God told me not to steal, but the number one reason why I don't steal is because God said, I, I should supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. So I don't, if I believe that God is my provider, I don't have to steal. Amen. So that's why I don't steal. But then it says, rather, he must labor. So you see, when a person doesn't, watch this verse, it's so full of pregnant with word. If you, it says, if you steal, you're most likely not going to be a worker or a laborer. But means it's going up, you're going one way, you turn around and go the other way. A thief is going to be a very, Simple person, he doesn't, he doesn't work. That's why the person steals, because he doesn't work. He thinks, that he, he thinks that he can steal from you because you have more than him because you cheated to get that money. No, how about the fact that I worked hard and you're not working hard, that's why you don't have any money. How about that? See, the very word labor here, I mean, this, I, I love this verse. It's so amazing. The word labor is defined. This is the de strong definition. It says work hard. Watch this. Feel fatigue, be wearied. <laughs> Glory to God. The Bible says that you must, in other words, there's, a, there's such a work. It's called hard work. Not just work, but hard work. Working so hard that you feel tired when you're done. I had a job when I was in college. I'm embarrassed to tell you all this story, but it's a, I got to tell you the truth because it's true anyway. I could keep it to myself, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. One of my first jobs I got in college, I was a freshman, and I went and I, I stayed over su the summer for, um, you know, to work, and and I, I did janitor work. And you know, the people that, that that were working with me, they were alongside of me. You know what they told me to do? They said, "So Derek, you know what? Um, do, do you can do this, this, and this, and this," because they were my bosses, and so I just did what they told me, told me to do. And said, "But when you get done." Just go in the bathroom, sit on the, on, the, on, the, on the sink, on the toilet there, and go, take a nap. I said, oh, really? I can do that. And so I did it. <laughs> now the question is, was I done with my work? No, I wasn't done with my work. If someone tells you something like that, you're going to do that with, over the work. And I remember the person, my boss, the boss that was their boss, walked in and looked all around because he was looking for me to find out where I was at. He didn't look in the stall. That's why he didn't find me. But I was so embarrassed and so ashamed after that happened, I said, here you are, they're paying you, and you're sleeping. Nobody should pay you for sleeping. That's why you don't have nothing. If you want to work, Pastor Lawrence taught, we must have value. Value means, it's short for valuable. 
You're valuable. That means somebody's paying you for what you can do. Not for what you can sleep. Sleep is important. You sleep on your own. Not when you're at work. When you're working, you should be working. You say, what if, what, if, what if you're done with your work? Find something else to do. Go above and beyond. Glory to God. Now, the word needs there, interestingly, I went through the biblical text, not all the verses. I just said, well, what does needs mean? Look at all these needs in the biblical text, all over the place. These are just verses that mention needs. The same word, the same Greek word, what is a need? Matthew 6, 8, Father knows what you, the things that you need. What things? And it goes to all kinds of things, from food to do- one man, man's need for a doctor. Uh, you know, going down the list, I'm not going to go through all these, but it says Paul worked to supply his own needs and others by, by you know, making tents and so on. So there was all kinds of things that needs, in other words, Philippians 4.19 says, uses the very same Greek word that means it's connected to this, this verse, verse, verse here. My God shall supply all your needs. Your needs are innumerable. Blessed is the man. Now watch this. If your needs are innumerable, now, first of all, I forgot something. Let me go back here. Look at this verse here, the last one, New Living Translation. It says, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must work performing with his hands what is good so that we, he will have something to share with one who has. The word something there says, who has need. The word something there says, man, that's, that's amazing that I'm sharing with somebody who has need. But the next verse says, you are to give generously to others in need. That's a different than having something to give to somebody. And now you must give generously to them. How can you give what you don't have? If you don't have generously, you can't give generously. How can you have generously if you don't believe, if you believe that there's no prosperity in life? This is not rocket science. This is, this is simply looking at the text, interpreting it exactly like it says. You, have, you don't have just something to give to them. You can just give them this. Let me see. I got a dollar. Let me give you this dollar right here. It says give generously to others. The word says others, not, not singular, plural. <laughs> now, everybody say, oh my. Luke 6.30, don't turn there. The Bible says in that verse says, give to everyone who asks. Come on now. Wait a minute. You didn't just cross the line now. Everybody? I didn't write it. I just read it. Y'all don't believe it? Turn to the verse. I, I'm just reading what the Bible says. Luke 6.30, Luke 29, and unto him that smites thee on one cheek, turn the other, this means, you know, of course, turning the cheek when someone's attacking you. To him that takes away the cloak, forbid not to take the cloak also. And then it says, give to every man that asks of thee, and of him that takes away thy goods, ask them not again. How are you going to do that when you ain't got nothing? (laughs) Do I believe that or do I not believe it? Then I say, oh my then I say, put on your seatbelts. This is impossible. That's why you need God. Living the Christian life is impossible. Can't happen. You will never succeed. You know what they do with this verse here? Say, so, well, I don't believe it says that. It says something else. Only way you can interpret this is to say, just ignore it and go on to the next verse. Give to everyone you ask? How many is everyone? How can you give something to them when you ain't got it? And then the verse 28 in the New Life, New Living Birth translation says you must give generously. Not just give to them something. It says you must give to them generously. Oh my. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, on top of that, Say, Pastor Jackson, there's something else. Oh, yeah. We ain't, we ain't ended yet. Psalms 41 says, blessed is he that considers the poor. A person can have a need without, no, without being poor. This is another group of people. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. 
Now, if you read the biblical text, all over the place the Bible talks about helping the poor. Not just in the Old Testament, New Testament, everywhere. Help the poor, help the poor. The question is, how do you help the poor? Do you give the poor money? Do you give the poor um, an education? Many times missionaries will go overseas and they'll find a place where poverty is and uh, I know it could be you know, different places in the world or there's abject poverty and they'll give them the gospel for so people to be saved. If the missionary gives them the gospel to how to be saved and walks away, he's done them a grave disservice. Jesus would never do that. Many missionaries will come in and say, take the gospel, get saved, and then they'll start doing things to help them how to produce, how to get drinking water. I, 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 I support a ministry right now. The whole ministry is based upon just digging wells and giving water to people. When I first saw it advertised, I cried like a little baby. I'm going to look at that and say, oh, that's too bad. What's next? People don't have water to drink. They're taking water down to a river. These are little black kids in Africa. Now, do you know what in Africa, do you know what's in a river in Africa? Who knows? Crocodiles. I said to myself, not on my watch. I'll do it and sacrifice what I need to sacrifice to help that. For water? <laughs> That's a basic need of life. But it takes money. See, I, you know, I can't go over there and help them with the water. I even though I, I just, I went to my side, I want to go over there to help. Because I, and I get, when I see things like that, I just become so motivated, I want to go to an extreme. And so I, people, that's not the will of God for anybody to live that way. Now, that's not because they're black or because they're white or brown. It's because there's been some kind of oppression by the government that has caused that kind of poverty. That's never the will of God. The poor must be helped, but how do you help the poor? Who is the, this verse says, blessed is he that considers the poor. Who is he in this verse? Who is he? Well, that, if it's you and me, as you say it's me, as, if it's you, me, it says, if you say it's us, that means you ain't part of the poor. There's two, pe- two different peoples there. He and the poor. He helps the poor. The poor doesn't help he. Why is the poor poor and you're not? There's all kinds of reasons for that. But it's our responsibility to challenge why that is the case. Not to get mad. Don't get mad in America because it's a rich nation. And that the, the abundance that America has has nothing to do with the, with the poverty in other nations of the world has nothing to do with it. The world will tell you that we stole their wealth. That is a lie. As long as you believe that, you will never help the poor. You'll say, the government of America should help the poor because they stole the poor, that money from the poor. That's a lie. God has given an inheritance to every nation, Deuteronomy 32, 8. Inheritance means what? The earth. Abundance. That means there's abundance in the earth wherever you are. It just takes knowledge applied to the earth and that brings forth productivity. Every nation can be abundant. America is, a, is an example of how that can be the, tr- the case. That's why if you want to follow how America became rich, you don't look at how we stole their wealth from other nations of the world, which is a lie. If you believe that America stole other people's wealth, then why do you have it? Say, oh my. Why are you taking somebody's stolen property? You think you're off the hook? If America stole their wealth and you have wealth from America, where'd you get your wealth from? That's why you can't, look, you can't listen to 99% of the, the pundits on, a, on television, liberal pundits, because they will tell you lies like that. That's not true. 
You can get money. You can, you, any country of the world can prosper, and God will prosper that country of the world and make them a rich nation. How do they, how do, they do it? The word of God. That's how you do it. The word consider. Blessed is a man that considers, means circumspect, intelligent, consider, expert, instruct, prosper, understand, wisdom, make wise, guide willingly. In other words, when we look at the poor, we don't look only at their poverty. In other words, a lack of money. We look at how they got that way and how we can help them to change that. You don't look only at their souls and their spirits so they can be born again. You look at how you can help them in every area of their life. That means you want to begin with salvation, eternal life, but you don't want to end there. You want to continue on to help them. You consider, what, what, what can we do to help this nation right here prosper? These people prosper. What can we do with, with that? That's what you do when you're helping the poor. One of the worst things you can, one of the worst things you can do in life and this might be, seem to be a contradiction, but it's not, is to hand, just hand people money. That's one of the worst things you can do. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It must mean, that's the reason why we have a blessing month here. You know the first thing I remember I told you to do? You say, Lord, who should I give to? You pray. Then you pray for the amount, and you give them the money, right? You don't just hand people money. Handing people money is one of the worst things because they will use it for evil if they don't know God. What, what, what is an alcoholic going to do if you hand him $100? He's going to go buy something to drink. Who do you think God's going to hold responsible for that? Not only him, but you. See, I got to quit now because my time is gone. But I'm going to jump on this last point. That's one of the reasons why the government involved in social matters, welfare, that's one of the reasons why it's evil. You don't hand folk money and expect the folk to just do something right. I think all we, can, all we need to do is raise the uh, minimum wage and that's going to help folk. I'm looking, I'm saying, man, y'all don't have an ounce of wisdom. All kind of folk make a million dollars and spend two million dollars and they broke because they can't handle the money. How much money you have does it make you, does it make you know how to use the money? We're talking about stewardship, making money and using money. You must know both. A strong man retains riches, retains it, which is a fleet. They, they flee from you. You must know how to use them. Otherwise, they will flee from you. That's why you just don't hand folk money. You have to pray and believe God for it because I said that was the last thing. One more, one more thing. This is the last thing. Government uses money to control you. You cannot be free when the government is paying for your welfare. I, I, we had last week, Booker T. Washington said, there's no such thing as political freedom apart from economic freedom. As a matter of fact, the economic freedom comes first and then the political freedom. You must be free economically in order to have uh, the ability even to understand how to, to deal with a government that's cheating and lying and stealing and handing people money and making them dependent upon you. You are a slave to the government. All they got to do is say, we don't like what, you, what you're saying. We're going to take the money back from you. And what are you going to do? You're going to conform to what they say. Right. We're seeing all over the culture right now. It's called the cancel culture. Right. Right. If you're on welfare, say, Lord, help me to get off of it because it's not your will for me to be, take money from the government to live. It's your will for me to be free economically. Get a job and work for a job and believe God how to multiply money and then get free even from the job. Glory to God. That's some good teaching right there. See, see, some of you say, Pastor Jackson, I don't live up to the standard. Well, that's all right. Who does? <laughs> I read the same Bible you read. You think I'm looking at that? I got that in my that, I'm, I, I, I reached, I'm That's me right there. No, I'm saying, oh my gosh, God, am I, are you kidding me? <laughs> Give to everybody you ask. That, my mind goes tilt and then tilt again and tilt again and tilt again. It's going to No, I'm not giving to everybody you ask. No, no. That's not happening. I don't even like him. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But now what am I going to do when the Bible tells me that? The same Bible that tells me how to get saved. The same Bible that tells me Jesus is the only way and truth, the only way to God and the Father is through the person of Jesus Christ. The same Bible tells me that. Not a different one. The same God spoke the same sentence. The same thought came from the same God. That's why you must have increase, prosperity in your life. Now, notice, n- notice what number I'm on right now. Look at the screen. How many, how, how many I got left? Yeah. Huh. Say about, everybody say, oh my. Oh my. <laughs> yeah, see, the Bible, God's word is real. And I'm, my goal is to help you to conform to it, to live out God's word. Don't think, well, I, I'm not there, therefore I can't get there. Think I'm not there, God help me to get there. Amen. That's how you think. He wants to help you. That's why this is such an important issue because it'll cause you to cry out to God. Say, Lord, I need you. I've been falling short of the glory of God. Everybody stand to their feet. I've fallen short of the glory of God and I need you to help me to live according to your word. That's why we're here this morning. That's why you come to church and hear the word of God is to, is to hear the man or woman of God expound on how you can live according to God's word. Young people here, teenagers and those who are in high school and college, begin to dream big. Don't let your friends and we want you seeing your parents be your end. Let God Almighty be your end. Stand on the shoulders of your parents and say, Lord, I can take off from here for the glory of God. Don't feel bad. Feel ho- don't, don't, don't let me, don't, let, don't think that I'm t- trying to take away your hope. I'm trying to give you hope, not take away your hope. We have a living hope, and his name is Jesus. And if you'll call upon him in the time of your need, he will give you a vision that's impossible to, to fulfill apart from him. That's true of every single human being on the earth. That's why he says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches, not on the earth, but in glory. He opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing, every amoeba, every insect, every bird, every human being, everything that has a need, he supplies that need because he's God and he's well able to. Father, I thank you this morning for everybody on the sound of my voice. Help us, Lord. (laughs) Begin that help with me. I need help. I must know that you are a provider, and that's not just a word that I say out of my mouth, but it's literally true. I look to you to provide my needs according to your riches and glory. Help us to look to you, O God. We may be in situations and circumstances right now that, that what I just said seems impossible. But you are the God of the impossible. All things are possible to him that believes. We choose to believe. I believe. Because your word cannot fail. And you alone are God. Thank you for it, Father. We bless you. Help us, Lord. Give us visions. Give us ideas. You are the God who gives ideas to obtain wealth that we may use to the glory of God to bring righteousness into the culture once again. Righteousness into our nation and then to the world that your great name might be made known throughout all the earth. I thank you for it, Father. I bless you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. And all of God's wonderful people say, Amen. If you're here today right now and you need to have prayer, I'm going to ask you to come forward in just a minute. You need salvation, rededication. You need healing in your body. You need to have, be, feel, be, be filled with power and speak in tongues. Any one of these areas. Or if there's another area of your life. You say, Pastor Jackson, I want to have an idea to obtain wealth. God, Deuteronomy 8.18. We didn't even go over that verse yet. It tells you it gives ideas to obtain wealth. Why you need to have wealth in order to do what God has called you to do in life. That's why it's important for you to get rid of the ideas that have been, that have been filling your mind that all I need is Jesus and all I need is, is, is a spiritual thing. It's spiritual and natural. It's not only spiritual. Amen. It's soulish and natural. Spirit, soul, and body. Amen. God provides all of our needs in every area of life according to his riches that are in, that are in glory. Thank you for it, Father. We bless you. 
and glorify you this morning and give you praise. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. If you need prayer, come forward. Praise the Lord. I want to pray for you and believe God with you. Amen. Otherwise, you are dismissed. <laughs>